All right, thanks everybody for being here. Good crowd. A couple housekeeping items before we begin. Of course, uh, put your laptops away. We'd like you to get your, your cell phones on silent and also out of sight. Uh, our guest has given up his valuable time, so we want to be as uh, attentive and as focused as possible. And uh, of course, if you're eating chips, pop the chips bag now. It's louder than it sounds up here. So without uh, anything further, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Don Heberly, class of 1994. Mr. Heberly is currently the chief executive officer of BNY Wealth Management, one of the top 10 wealth management companies in the United States. In addition to his CEO duties at the wealth manager, he is on BNY Mellon's operating committee and a member of the investment policy and special investments committee. Mr. Heberly has been with BNY Wealth Management since 1997 previously serving as the executive director with responsibility for wealth strategy and international wealth management. He also has significant experience managing family office portfolios. Additionally, he's worked in management consulting, so th there's something here for the consultants in the room as well. And uh, he holds a bachelor in economics from Harvard College, and of course his MBA from right here at Tepper. He stays involved in the local community as the president of the Harvard Club of Western Pennsylvania, and as a member of the Duquesne Club. We're very glad he has taken his time to come join us today. Let's give him a real round of applause. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to a man who needs no introduction in this room, <laughs> Dean Damon. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're very happy that you're here today. I also want to point out we have some uh, online hybrid students that are joining us as well, up here on a little iPad. Uh, so welcome to you as well, wherever you're from. <laughs> we're glad you're here. Um, I also want to point out uh, Don is, uh, has recently joined the uh, Tepper School's Business Board of Advisors. Uh, which is a group of about 18 uh, alumni from the school who uh, provide advice and support uh, to the dean and, and to, this, to the school. We had a meeting last, uh, last week, mm -hmm. and your first one. I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you thought of that. Uh, it was quite lively, I would say. It was say. very yeah. lively, yeah. <laughs> a lot of personalities in that meeting. And the other thing I'll point out is, is Don actually grew up here in Pittsburgh, actually south of Pittsburgh in, uh, in Bethel Park. So he is a uh, native, uh, native Pittsburgher. Um, so um, this is going to be very informal, and I'm going to just sort of ask a few questions. We'll leave plenty of time at the end for our students to ask questions uh, of their own. Um, so let me begin. I, you know, I'm always interested, um, first of all, thank you for coming back, but I'm always interested in um, how, our, uh, how our alumni um, got started in their careers and the progression they had and, and the kinds of uh, decisions or experiences that you had along the way that you felt were particularly beneficial and helpful to you in developing yourself into what you now are as the CEO mm -hmm. of BNY uh, Mellon uh, Wealth Management. So could, could you kind of just give us a sense of when you left here in 1994, where did you go? Uh, how did your career progress? What kind of things happened along the way that, uh, that you found beneficial to you? And was there a plan involved in any way? Yeah, that, you know, so I get that. Um uh, first of all, it's great to be back, um, and thank you all for coming. The, the biggest worry I had was show up, and we'd have an empty room here, right? And we should get lunch and some water, and that's about it. Um, so thanks for, uh, for showing up. I, I guess um, what I'd say as it relates to sort of career, you know, when I left here at the end of 94, I, I was a flex time student, um, and so I was working full time while I was here. I was working at PNC uh, in their credit department. Um, as a credit analyst, basically. So my training, sort of uh, business training anyway, was, was sort of on the credit side, not so much on the investment management or the wealth management side of, uh, of our business. So that was my uh, sort of work experience during my time here at, at Tepper. Uh, I left here after graduating, and I went into the consulting world. So you heard a little bit about my background. Um, and so for the consultants in the room or the aspiring consultants in the room, that was my uh, sort of first role after. I went to a firm called Capgemini. Um, and I was in their financial services practices uh, practice. So I knew sort of financial services, broadly speaking, financial services was the career path for me. I wanted to be involved somehow, some way. Um, I didn't have a plan exactly sort of where that would lead or exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew it was financial services 
uh, oriented. So I joined their financial services practice. We did uh, consulting work for banks, for investment banks, for insurance companies. We did a project for the World Bank uh, in Washington, DC. I did some work domestically. I did some work internationally. It was about a four-year stint. Um, and I said, we, uh, for some of the folks who were at the earlier session here today, it might be a little bit of a repeat. I thought it was um, some of the best experience that I ever had um, for a number of reasons. One is you could go really deep on a particular issue in a relatively short period of time, um, learn about a particular function, a particular issue, a particular business problem, uh, go very deep and get exposure to lots of different and particularly senior level managers um, at various companies early on in a career. So whether that was a strategy problem and we did a lot of M&A strategy, business acquisition and divestiture kind of work, we did business process stuff, very basic stuff for an insurance company around claims processing and how do we do it and how do we do it more efficiently. Um, we did a project for the World Bank, which was really a resource allocation problem. So the World Bank takes in a lot of money. They have to figure out how much goes to Africa and how much goes to Asia. And they have vice presidents in all these places. And they all sort of present their, their case for how the, uh, the dollars should be allocated. And we were very much involved in creating a structure for how that gets allocated. So I thought it was a great experience, great exposure. That was my first job. I did it for about four years or so. Um, consulting, is, as you all know, is sort of a road warrior kind of job. Um, and decided for, for sort of personal reasons and professional reasons that I didn't want to make a career as a consultant. Um, for two reasons. One, personally, at the time of the life, uh, uh, life I was in, um, we had one child. My wife was pregnant with our second. And, um, and I wanted to be here a little bit more than, than all over the world, um, as I had been in the past, uh, the prior four years. So it made sense, personally, to make a change. Um, and professionally, I sort of had, had decided I wanted to go deep in something. I wanted to know something well. I wanted to be expert in something. And so having now the experience of four years as a consultant, um, I felt it was sort of the right time to look for the next thing. So I ended up joining Mellon Bank um, at the time. That was 97 from there. Um, I joined in the wealth management group. I joined as, a, as what we would call an associate portfolio manager, so part of a team that worked on large family relationships. Um, one of those relationships was the Mellon family, so I got exposure to sort of that relationship um, early on. Um, spent a couple of years doing that. Um, and then the real change for me, um, I think, was moving from that, so that was a sort of investment um, related uh, but client service role um, and moving into our investment organization. So I took a role after a few years as our director of investment strategy. Um, got me back out on the road a little bit, ironically. I had sort of changed jobs to do less traveling. It got me on the road a little bit again. Um, but my job was to go out and meet with our clients as well as meet with our own internal employees and talk about the economy and the markets and what do we think, what's our view, what do we think clients should be doing in this environment, should we be overweight here and underweight here, adding to this, taking away from that. And that was sort of the job um, and setting strategy for our organization, wealth management organization uh, broadly. And then our individual relationship managers would sort of take that input, apply it to their uh, individual client situations, and sort of make those decisions accordingly. But um, it was a big step um, for me in terms of decisioning, meaning I wanted to get um, onto the investment side, the more, the more detailed uh, investment side of, uh, of our organization. It led to an opportunity. I did that for a few years. led to an opportunity to come back onto the business side and run our family office business. So I had worked for a number of years um, in the business on the client service side. I came back um, uh, when that opportunity presented itself to, to run that business. That was sort of the, the biggest chunk of, of my 20 years uh, career, uh, was leading our family office business. I described it um, earlier, and, and, and back then I described it as almost like a club in some ways. We had um, a group of clients in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh serviced by a team here, same thing in Boston and same thing in, uh, in Philadelphia. But it was not something that we, that we um, thought of as a growth business or commercialized. Um, it was more clients would call us and they say, hey, we heard you're doing some really good things for this family. Can you help us as well? And so the idea was, the, the, the strategic uh, idea was, how do we really grow it um, in a way that was very different than what we had done uh, previously, we had some talented people, we had some capabilities, we had a client base that we really hadn't capitalized on, and so how do we grow it uh, from there? So I spent most of my time um, thinking about and, and working on growing the family office business 
Um, did that, as I said, for a number of years. Moved into our international business. Um, for a handful of years, we opened offices in Toronto, uh, in London, in Hong Kong, um, and in the Middle East. Um, so sort of the irony of that whole thing is I took the job at Mellon way back to travel a lot less. I ended up 10 years later traveling even more than I was as a consultant um, internationally. Uh, did that for a few years, and then, uh, and then a couple of years ago, um, was asked to take the leadership role of our, of our business overall. So that seems like a combination of, uh, of some planning on your part, knowing where you wanted to go, but at the same time taking advantage of some opportunities along yeah. the way. Yeah, and I would, yes, exactly. And, and um, uh, you know, I think the right answer, the expected answer, is it's sort of very planned out. And I think people, I've got kids who are sort of thinking about careers in college and just out of college, and I think there's, there's a fair amount of expectation, and I'm not sure where it comes from necessarily, that you, you need to know and you need to have a plan and sort of work against that plan um, from day one. Um, I would tell you that I certainly didn't have that plan from day one. I, um, I was very open to different opportunities, different experiences, um, in some cases taking some risk uh, around roles that I hadn't had before. And, and maybe one thing that's, that's important to say here too is that um, very much not in a straight line. <laughs> Uh, so careers, certainly mine and most of the people that I work with and for and the people that I interview when I look at resumes, and I interview a lot of folks today, um, is careers, I'm more interested, frankly, in careers that aren't a straight line with sort of a diversity of experiences and backgrounds and, um, and, and roles um, type of thing. So mine was certainly not um, a straight line. And I will tell you, in fact, that when I made the move intentionally, and I talked about the, the reasons behind it, but when I made the move from um, from the consulting business to come back to Mellon, um, by sort of any measure um, from the outside in, uh, somebody would look at that rightly and say it looks like a step backwards, right? It, it doesn't look like the obvious next step in a career progression. It doesn't look like an obvious promotion into from this role to a bigger, broader, higher paying kind of role. It was, um, and that was intentional because I wanted to go, I knew I wanted to be in the investment management, wealth management business at that point. Um, and this was an opportunity to get in, and, and it, was, it was less money and less responsibility. I was managing a team of people at the time in the consulting organization. I was going to an individual contributor role to make less than I was before, um, but it was an intentional choice yeah. at the time. I'm interested in, um, you know, there's a lot of smart people that don't advance to, you know, positions like the one you have now. Can you sort of speak a little bit about the skill sets that you found uh, most useful to you in your career and, and how they changed, actually, uh, early on as an individual contributor, and now that you're a leader at, uh, at BNY Mellon, sort of what, what kind of skill sets are most valuable to you, and how has that changed over your career? Yeah. Um, you know, I would say there's a, there's a few in particular that have been, I think, um, that are incredibly important. Um, and I'll come back to it in a minute, but I, I sort of referenced that I interview a lot of people. Um, and so in the role that I'm in now, um, most of the time when people get to me in the interview stage, I'm not the first interview, I'm usually the last interview. Um, and, and when people get to me, I tell them, um, I say, look, my role in this process, the way I think of my role in this process anyway, is not to evaluate you as a candidate um, on the technical skills and the competencies. I'm assuming that by the time you get to me, everybody else who has met with this person has sort of signed off on that. Otherwise, otherwise I don't see them at all. So I say, look, my, my role in this is to make sure, um, in my mind and in yours, that you're a good fit for our organization. Because culture for us matters a lot, and the kinds of people we hire matters a lot. And so I spend the hour, if I have it, or 45 minutes, and in some cases, if it's um, longer, mostly digging on that. Um, what is it that you're all about? What drives you? What do you want to do? What kinds of things excite you? Um, what are you passionate about? How do you think about working with other people? How do you think about working with clients? Whatever those things are. But I spend all of my time on, on sort of fit as opposed to technical skills um, uh, in, from an interviewing perspective. And when I think about that for me and sort of skills along the way, um, I think there are two or three um, that, I would, that I would sort of point out. Um, in, in almost any business, um, communication is critically important. Um, and I think whether that's communicating internally uh, among teams, uh, up or down in an organization, or communicating externally with clients, with prospects, with intermediaries, with other people who are influential in your business, whatever that happens to be, 
Um, I worry a little bit about communication and communication skills generally. I have three kids, and I worry about communication skills. Um, and I think it's, it's really, really important. Um, the other one that, that, I would, um, that I would point out is, and, and I think this gets harder and harder, um, the further up in an organization you go or the broader your responsibilities become because people expect things of you when you're, when you're, sort of they, um, when you're in those roles, and that's listening. Um, I think w one of the things, and, and uh, people who work with me or for me might, um, might argue on this, I actually think listening as a skill is one of the things that I do well, and I think it's really, really important. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency um, sometimes particularly among um, leaders, I think, that to feel like you have to be the loudest voice in a room, to feel like you have to know the answer, and to feel like you have to sort of jump in um, uh, often in discussions. Um, my style, for better or for worse, but my style tends to be to sort of let discussion go um, and listen more than, more than I engage. In the end, look, in the end, in my role and in, in, in folks who have roles like mine, um, when you don't get to agreement in that discussion, you have to make the decision. Um, but, but I view my role as to make sure that everybody um, who has a point of view um, gets to air that point of view before I uh, sort of come in with, with my questions or thoughts or what we should do. Um, in any management team, in any team, there are, there are bigger personalities than others. There are louder voices than others. Um, the risk in those is that the louder voices and the bigger personalities carry the day um, all the time, and they're not always the best ideas. And so I think uh, part of my job as a listener and a facilitator is to make sure that all the voices in those meetings are heard before we get to a conclusion. So BNY Mellon's wealth management business is global, mm -hmm. right? So, and I don't know how many employees you have. But what are the biggest challenges as the leader of this organization that you, that you face? Yeah. Um, so we're about 2,000 people globally. Um, most of them are here in the US. We're largely a US-based wealth management um, organization. But we do have, um, as I mentioned, some offices outside the US. About 10% of our business is non-US. Most of it is, is domestic. Um, so, uh, so a few challenges, um, and, and we talked about this earlier. It might be repeat for some of the, some of the folks who are here from the morning session. Um, but I'll add uh, maybe one or two to it. So one of the challenges is, um, I talked a little bit about it, is decision making. And, and what I mean by that is when you're in, when you're in a role like mine, um, you're the last stop for decisions, right? There's nobody else to go to. So every decision that can get made that's easy to make or is non-controversial or, or, or otherwise sort of gets made before it gets to you. Um, and so the only ones that show up on my desk are the decisions that, are, that somebody doesn't want to make, doesn't know how to make, or, or um, is not sure what to do with. So those are the decisions that I get to, um, to make. So that's a challenge um, in any organization sort of of any size when you're sort of the last stop in the decision-making chain. Uh, so that's one of the challenges. The, uh, another challenge um, is, uh, is um, we're in a big global company, so you heard um, right, our, our wealth management business is large in its own right. We're, we're one of the top 10 wealth managers in the US and, and probably in the top 20 or so globally as a wealth management firm. But we're inside an even bigger company. We're part of a massive organization. So we're 2,000 people. BNY Mellon overall is 50,000 people. It's big. Um, and so we have a challenge to make sure that we, um, I, as a business, that we sort of take all the good um, from being part of a big organization, and there's a lot of it, right? There's a lot of uh, infrastructure, there's a lot of, of technology spend, there's a lot of capabilities, and it's a lot of good. Take all that good and make sure that we incorporate it into our business in a way that's really good for our business and our clients, and try to, to, to sort of um, not get distracted in some ways by all the other stuff that, that a big company has to get involved in and, and that might slow us as a business down. So that's, um, uh, that's a second challenge. And then the third, or a third challenge um, is um, how do we make sure that what we do as, as our business wealth management, that, um, that your experience as a client is similar regardless of where you interact with us. So we have an office in Seattle, and we have one in Miami, and one in Chicago, and one in, in Hong Kong. And, and my goal, one of the things that I talk a lot about in our organization is making sure that 
Um, it feels like something to be a BNY Mellon client, regardless of where you, um, there's a consistency in that client experience, a consistently good um, client experience, but a consistency in that client experience. So you think about other firms or other brands or other expectations, and we use the, uh, the, the example sometimes of Starbucks, right? As you sort of know what you're going to get when you go into Starbucks almost wherever you go. Um, and, and you know what you're going to get if you walk into a Four Seasons almost wherever you go. Um, and so setting that expectation and then delivering on it across a big global firm is a, um, is a challenge. Yeah. Something you said earlier resonated with me a bit, which is you're making decisions that nobody else wants to make or that you can't get agreement on, consensus on. Um, now I, I'm sort of running a very much smaller operation here than, than you're, you're running. One of the challenges that I've found myself, and, and I'd be interested in hearing how you handle this, is just having the right information to make the decision. How do you make sure that when you're making a decision, you're getting the information you need to make the right decision, especially within an organization that is so big and diverse as the one that you're running? Yeah, it's one of the bigger challenges, right? I mean, and, and it goes back to one of the, part of the answer there goes back to the point I was making before, that um, if you don't hear from everybody, then you may not get all the information, right? And there always will be, as I said, there are always going to be the sort of the bigger personalities and the louder voices, and you have to make sure that, that you draw out from the people who are not necessarily the biggest personalities and loudest voices their, their view, because uh, information can be data. Um, information can be sort of opinions and judgment um, and, and, or combinations of that stuff, so you have to make sure you get both of it. We're, I think we're pretty good. Um, on sort of the, the MIS side of it, right? Sort of getting data. We're not we're not all the way there um, on it, but it. Um, I, I think that's the biggest challenge is making sure that you sort of hear from all of the interested parties and everybody that that, that has a view or should have a view. Yeah. So speaking of data and technology, yeah. so um, you know technological innovation and and uh, the ubiquity of data and the power of analytics is disrupting transforming every industry and changing business models. Um, can you speak a little bit about how this sort of trend uh, is affecting wealth management specifically? Mm -hmm. And what do you see as the future of wealth management in a world that's being run by artificial intelligence and, and uh, machine learning and, and those kinds of things? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's, it's a, one of the issues that we probably spend time thinking about explicitly or otherwise every day. Um, and there's at least a few sort of obvious ways that, um, that, it, that technology, data, AI, analytics is impacting our business broadly. Um, one, which um, everybody here will have heard about, is, is sort of this idea of robo-advisors and digital advice. And um, and I've actually met with a number of those firms. We, you know, um, Betterment is in New York. They're not far from where we are. Most of them are on the West Coast. But we've had discussions with a number of them to just sort of understand um, a little bit more about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And, um, and, and I would say um, my, my view on where this, that particular um, um, uh, technology goes is I think it, particularly in our business, so our business, the wealth management business, sort of is, is high net worth and up individuals all the way up um, to very large, wealthy global families that we work with. So I think that, um, um, that the risk to us is not completely disintermediated by those firms, but the, the, the integration or the partnership of um, technology with advice. Um, because we, roll, we, we think of our role in a lot of ways primarily from a wealth management perspective, as in the advice business. Um, I don't think we are in the investment business only. We're not in the banking business only. We're not in the financial planning business only. We're in all of those things, and we do all of those things. But the knitting together of those things in a way that makes sense for a particular client, a particular family, given their circumstance, whatever that happens to be, is, is how I think of our business. So it's sort of an, it's very advice heavy. Um, uh, supplemented by or supported by lots of important things, and technology is one of them. So I actually view this as a positive thing. I think technology can help us um, in a lot of ways and help clients in the way we interact with them, in the way we help them solve problems, in the way, in the way we help them think about particular issues. So I think that evolution 
the robo-advice evolution is one where there's actually more partnership between advice-like firms like us, technology-driven firms like those, um, those platforms. I think they come together as opposed to they're sort of a winner or a loser in there. I think they come together in a lot of ways. That's sort of the uh, one way I think about it. Um, the other way, or another way I think about it, um, is how we find clients and how our, our um, distribution model, business development. We don't have, uh, as, as a firm, we don't have, we're not in the retail banking business. So we don't have branches, we don't have a retail network. Those branch networks and retail franchises can be feeders for a wealth management business. They send, uh, can send clients to wealth management firms. We don't have an investment bank, so we don't have a natural feeder there either. So we use um, actively uh, today and more actively over time um, technology and, and uh, sort of uh, digital strategies to find and attract clients. Um, and we do a lot of analytics around where clients who would be good fits for us are online. And you know, we're, whether that's we, we, um, we're prominent on uh, Reuters and we're prominent on The Economist. Um, and certain sites and certain other publications, Golf Digest is actually a good outlet for us, interestingly enough. Um, so we spend a lot of time digitally um, in Golf Digest to try and draw people. And then we can track every click, people who click through all the way, and we can track somebody who becomes a client today. We know their first interaction with us 18 months ago was through this particular site or this particular interaction. And, and we can learn from that over time. So our distribution model, we're never going to be Merrill Lynch with 17,000 advisors. And so our distribution model has to be much more efficient than that. Yeah. So, um, when you look at passive versus active investing, so that must have some role to play in, in, uh, in your business. What, what's the, um, and given the trends that, that you're seeing towards more passive mm -hmm. investing, what, how does that impact the business? How do you approach that? Yeah, um, we have a, so um, in a lot of different ways. As a firm, so within our wealth management business, again, we sit inside this big company that's in lots of other uh, businesses. One of the other things we do as a big company, we're in the asset management business. So we have asset managers that we own, most of whom are in the active management space. Some equity, some fixed income, some non-traditional, some outside the US, some in the US, but, but we're in the active management space largely. Um, we do have um, passive solutions that we use um, for our clients too. Uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, look, it's hard to argue with some of the, um, um, some of the research um, and, and, and data as it relates to um, passive management. And so we think that there is, um, there is a place for, and we use in our client portfolios um, in certain circumstances, passive solutions. Um, and then around that, we build or use um, active strategies as well um, in traditional asset classes as well as um, non-traditional asset classes. I think that momentum is going to continue. There's a lot of momentum behind this idea of, um, of using passive strategies. I think it will continue. Um, I think, and we were talking about this earlier also today, is what will be interesting to see is when, when that gets stressed. Um, and when it gets stressed is in a, um, in a difficult market environment, which we haven't had in a while. We've been you know, sort of 10 years, more or less, in a straight up market. At some point, that will change. Um, and it will be interesting to see what happens when that changes um, and stresses um, the, the, um, the market, uh, what happens there, right? Because we were talking, I, I read a statistic, we were talking about this earlier too, is that um, October was a good month for the market, um, but if you strip out the five big tech, you, know, you take out Apple and Netflix and Google and Facebook and Amazon, I think, out of the S&P 500, it was sort of a you know, flattish to OK month performance-wise, X those five, which are big weights in the S&P. When that turns, and, and, and it's when that turns, um, it will be interesting to see, right, sort of as people start getting out and decide, you know what, that's been a great run, and I'm going to start to get out, and they lighten up and lighten up and lighten up and that gets faster on the way down, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. So I'm going to have one more question, and we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience here. And, and it's, uh, the question is somewhat self-serving. OK. <laughs> um, has to do with uh, you know, advice for our students. As yeah. they begin their careers, uh, what advice would you have for them? Maybe thinking about what, would, what 
would you have liked to have known in 1994 that you know today? Yeah. Um, and, and then the second part of that is what role did the, your education here play? In, I would like uh, to have known that the market was going to crash in 1997. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to have known the Astros were going to win the World Series this yeah. year. My name would be on the building instead of somebody <laughs> yeah. if I knew all those things. Um, so if, I guess a few things, right? Um, uh, and, I, and I touched on it a little bit before, right? So I, I, I think there's my kids, I know they do, um, and others feel like, um, again, there's this sort of this, you have to know where you're going to, right? You have to sort of have this plan, and in 20 years, I want to be here, and so if I want to be there in 20 years, then there's the 16 things I need to do between now and then. Um, I'm not sure that's realistic. Um, it will work in some cases, I'm sure, and I'm sure there's some people who look back uh, from 20 years and say, like, I just sort of hit every marker along the way. I think that's probably the exception. Um, and so I think allowing some flexibility, allowing some... Um, deviation from the plan, um, taking some risk, and recognizing, importantly, recognizing um, that things don't happen in a straight line, right? Careers are not straight lines. Um, I talk about this with the people I interview a lot. I mentioned, um, and this is a really not good analogy, I don't think. It might resonate with some people. I actually have this, this hang-up um, that, that kid, and my kids all uh, you know, played different sports growing up. I have this hang up that kids specialize playing sports way too early. I think it's a I don't think it's a healthy thing. And and I'm gonna bring this back around to career advice and you'll tell me if it resonates or not. But um, but I don't think it's a healthy thing, right? I don't think it's it's a good thing for an eight year old or a ten year old to decide that I only want to be a soccer player ever, and I, or I only want to be a baseball player ever, or I only want to be a saxophonist ever, whatever it is. Um, I think it's a I think it's an unhealthy thing. So um, how does that play into career advice. I think it's um, allowing some diversity in background experience, big company, small company, big team, small team, domestic, international, technology, business, whatever those things are, I think a collection of those things is a really valuable portfolio as opposed to only one thing ever. Um, not to say that only one thing ever can't work and won't ever work because there will be exceptions every time. but. You know, I'd say from my experience um, and my interactions, and I interview, like I said, I interview a lot of people, um, I'm intrigued by resumes that have diversity in them, that somebody worked in this particular industry and this particular function and did something like investment banking. And then they went and did something completely different, um, and they got some very different client experience or whatever it is. That's intriguing to me. Um, in a way that, that somebody who's been 20 years doing the same thing, and now they want to do that job for us, um, uh, or a related kind of job for us um, is. I, I just think bringing that perspective um, is, is valuable. And so that would probably be the one thing that I would say is, is um, don't be afraid. Um, it, it's OK to have sort of a, I, I, I'm passionate about this, and I know I want to sort of end up in this, in this realm sort of somewhere. Um, don't be afraid to sort of take a, a detour along the way or a side. Um, it, you know, have a reason for doing it. Because when you're in front of somebody like me or otherwise, and they ask you, why'd you do this? Have, a, have a, a rationale for why you did it. I wanted this experience. I thought it would be great. It was something different for me. I had focused all of my time on this. And I really felt like I had sort of a personal gap in this particular area, whatever it is. So be able to explain it, have a reason for doing it. Um, but I don't think you should be afraid of doing that at all, yeah, would great. be my advice. Great. OK, time for some questions. Anybody got any questions out there? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for your insights and your advice, especially on leadership and communication. My name is Wei, and my question is actually inspired by a previous speaker who, advised, who gave us the advice that the higher you go in terms of responsibilities and things like you, the less truth you hear about yourself. So as my peers and I are getting ready to jump into the next phase of our career, what advice do you have for us to distill the truth about ourselves as we yeah. So that's a really, um, if you didn't hear the question, um, let me repeat it for everybody. But the, but the gist of it is the higher you go in an organization, maybe you're the more responsibility you have, the less truth you hear about yourself, which I think is probably largely true, um, uh, or at least in a lot of cases, uh, largely true. It's certainly a risk, right? The more responsibility you have, the more influence you have, people can potentially be unwilling. Um, to tell it like it is and tell you what they really think. 
Um, it's one of the reasons, for me anyway, it's one of the reasons that I tend to be, I talked a little bit about it before, um, more quiet and let the discussion go, right? So if, if we're talking about a particular issue and I've got my leadership team around the table, at the point I weigh in on that issue, it, um, I run the risk of stopping the discussion, right? Because I've sort of weighed in and now, it, and now I put everybody in the room in the position of having to say something that, that they feel like is, is not what I think. Which is perfectly fine, by the way, but it's hard for people to do that. Um, in some cases, anyway, it's hard for people to do that. So, um, so one bit of advice it would go back to something I said before: is that you don't need to be the loudest voice in the room. You don't need to weigh in early, and, and don't let people know. You, you may be on a conclusion on a particular issue. I would argue you probably shouldn't be. You should let the discussion happen and then get to the conclusion. Even if you do have a conclusion, um, let the discussion go. Um, draw out all the various opinions uh, before you sort of weigh in on it. Um, I think is probably the most the most important thing um, as it relates to that. The other is um, is a willingness to, to to have your mind changed, right? Because if you don't have a willingness to have your mind changed, then and you and that's your style, and people figure that out, then as soon as you do weigh in, it's why bother with a different opinion because it doesn't matter anyway. So um, so another important part is to be willing to be talked out of something or have your mind changed. So you go into the meeting, you think about, here's what I think we should do. You listen to the discussion, you weigh in, and then there's sort of further discussion around it. If, it, if it's compelling um, and you're willing to make, your, uh, to make a change, uh, that shows a lot. That, that is a big, big part of leadership, right? Leaders generally view um, that as a weakness. Too often they view it as a weakness. Right, um, having your mind change or changing your mind on a particular issue, but if you're willing to do it um, with, with, as I said, sort of compelling data, information, judgment, whatever it is, um, and willing to do it, then I think that's a that's a, um, a that's actually a sign of strength, and I think you get a lot of credibility from the people around you if you do it. Yes. is about, so we just had a class on managing people and teams, so we talked about how we motivate our employees. So I would like to know, like, in your experience, how you motivate your employees to perform at their best? Yeah. Um, so we, um, we do a number of things around that. Um, we're organized in teams as well. So our business is largely um, team-based. We have roles that are individual contributors. Um, but we're largely team-based. We're actually changing, and this is a, this is a um, a, a controversial thing to do, but we haven't done it in a long time, and comp plans are, are very personal um, for people, right? Matters a lot, should matter a lot. And so we, we're, we're actually in the process of redesigning, rethinking, restructuring the comp plans for a big group of, of, of our employees, most of our client-facing, not our back office, most of our client-facing team. Um, that will actually be more, even more than we are today, more oriented towards a combination of individual performance and team performance. There's a, there's a linkage there today, but it's, it's not as strong as we'd like it to be. So one way to do it um, is through comp plans. That's sort of the stick approach, um, which is, you know, you do this and here's the plan. Um, we're also doing it through the carrot approach, which is um, uh, culturally, again, sort of getting back to this idea of, of um, being consistent everywhere we are, and, and the interview process and the kind of people we hire. The kind of people we hire and the kind of people who tend to be successful uh, in our organization anyway are predisposed to being um, team-oriented people. We don't do a lot of um, hiring away from a competitor, some um, all-star type person, pay them a lot of money, bring them in, and, and they are then um, sort of and supposed to be an all-star in our organization. It doesn't typically work for us, so we don't have a lot of people who fit that description anyway. So, so we do two things to try and do it. One is, um, in, in terms of the people we hire, the culture, and the expectations we set tends to be that, um, and then the you know, sort of the compensation systems on the back end tend to be much more designed towards team success as opposed to individual. Yeah. Market is in all times high. At the same time, you have North Korea, uh, the Russian scandal, uh, all these things happening. 
So how are you advising your clients right now? Yeah. So there's a real wealth management question, right? That is, that's, that would be like typical of almost any discussion we'd have with a client now, right? So it's a great question. Um, and, and when I was in my director of investment strategy job, I'd have a good answer for it. Um, today, I would delegate that. <laughs> Here's what I would say. Um, I'd say a few things. We are, um, we are very much uh, of the mind, and, and the relation, the, the clients that we have, we're very much of the mind that um, we sort of think about things from a long-term perspective. Um, having said that, um, it's, in, it's amazing to me uh, that the market has, has completely discounted everything, uh, all the noise, right? The North Korea noise, the Russian noise, um, it's become, and maybe it, because it's become um, less noise and more, uh, more sort of regular, common, everyday stuff, that it gets discounted uh, pretty considerably. We're, we're sort of of the view that the market is in the neighborhood of fairly valued as opposed to overvalued. With rates low, um, it doesn't feel as extended. With earnings growth where it is, it doesn't feel quite as extended. Um, the underlying economic debt, two quarters in a row now of 3% GDP, which we haven't had in a long time. So we feel actually pretty good about a, a lot of the underlying fundamentals from a growth perspective, from a valuation, interest rate perspective. Um, so we're sort of of the, of the view that we are fairly valued. So what would that imply, right? That would imply, for now anyway, um, a sort of stay the course, but be cautious to adding, right? If you're sort of coming in with new cash today, or you're thinking about rebalancing, what do you do? Um, we would sort of err on the side of being cautious on the way in, um, and sort of averaging in or lever uh, le uh, legging into the market. Um, we're always um, of the belief that rebalancing and discipline makes sense. So, so our approach is, um, you know, with, with sort of a macro view, we meet with an individual client or family, understand what, what your situation is, what are you trying to accomplish, are you still in wealth creation mode, are you in, I've already made all the money I'm going to make, I don't want to have to make it again, please fit, uh, protect it for me. Um, are you in the mode of, of giving money away, are you in the mode of, um, I want to do this for my kids, are you in the mode of, so we've got to understand all of that. Um, once we understand all of that, we are, we are really focused on being disciplined around, okay, that, that's sort of the structure and the framework for us, and then how do we manage within that, and be pretty aggressive around rebalancing. So there are plenty of rebalancing opportunities. If your portfolio, given all the stuff we just learned about you, we think your portfolio should look like this, and you haven't done anything in the last 12 or 18 months, just by virtue of the markets doing what they're doing, you're out of balance. And so we think it's probably a good time to think about rebalancing back to what your targets are. Doesn't mean you're selling, doesn't mean you're getting out, but you are sort of rebalancing away from things that have performed very well and adding to things that performed uh, less well. Um, so the advice we give is, uh, is don't lose sight of what it is you're trying to accomplish in the first place. Don't react to every news cycle, every headline, because it just makes you crazy every day. Uh, every morning, whenever it is, every tweet, right? so <laughs> don't react to every one. Um, and understand what it is you're trying to accomplish and sort of within that framework make, make sort of um, intelligent, intentional decisions as opposed to emotional, irrational decisions. To what extent do, does personal tax get in the way of this rebalancing that you're, you're advising? It, uh, all the time, right? Most of our clients, almost all of our clients are taxable um, investors. And so um, what really matters is after tax, after fee return, right? So at the end of the day, that's what matters. And so, um, so it gets in the way, um, and we sort of, that happens mostly at our individual level. Um, and it, and we, we are active with our clients in rebalancing to look for um, things that maybe haven't performed as well where we can take losses to offset gains. So we'll do that wherever we can and be very active in terms of harvesting losses um, to offset gains that we take. We're, we're very active doing that. Um, the, the thing that we, and, and then the other, I guess I would say, is depending on, on tax sensitivity, um, the, your, your sort of tolerance will, will expand or, right? So if you're, to be very simple about it, if, you, if your portfolio is 60-40 or your target is 60-40, if your tax tolerance is 
is high, meaning you're sort of not particularly sensitive to taxes, then you'd rebalance all the time, right? Sort of every day you'd think about sort of bringing yourself back to 60-40 and you can do it. If your tolerance is, um, is different than that low and you're very sensitive to taxes, then you might be willing to sort of let that range go further before you take some action um, and be very aggressive looking for ways to offset with, with losing um, investments as well. Yeah. But it's a big factor. Tax is a big factor for our clients. And what about alternatives relative to just sort of standard stocks and bonds? Are you heavy into that? Yeah, for we some are. Clients? Yeah, for some clients. And it's generally speaking, you know, sort of the, the further up you go in the wealth scale, the, the, the more, right? Because the, 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 the risks there um, are greater in a, in, a, in a lot of different ways, right? One of them is the liquidity risk, right? At some level... Um, clients can't tolerate the liquidity risk or the, or the lack of liquidity in those investments, and so they don't use them at all. Um, and then the, the sort of the wealthier you are, they can't tolerate that. But we're, and so it varies is the short answer, but we're very active in, um, in alternatives, private equity and hedge funds. Time for one more question. I think we have this gentleman here. Hi, my name is Rishabh Kendra. I have a question that you said that you don't have standard channels to get clients, right? So, Um, so the question sort of around um, client acquisition and, and how does that work? So yeah, we don't have the traditional uh, distribution channels that maybe some of our competitors do, and we don't have thousands and thousands of financial advisors that are in the in the client acquisition mode. We do have our model the way we're structured. We have people who, whose job it is to find new relationships for us, but that's in the you know hundreds of people, not thousands of people, who do that um, for us. So, uh, and we compete with lots of firms. We compete with J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Northern Trust and Wells Fargo, and we compete with the, you know, the betterments of the world in, in some small um, intersection of clients. We compete with small local RIA firms and broker dealers, and so everybody. People love the wealth management business for a lot of good reasons, but but it's a crowded space, right? Lots of people are in it in very different ways. So we compete on a few things um, where we differentiate. Um, one, one is we actually we, we take the benefit of and we compete on the benefit of our company, right? We're big, we're global. There's some strength and stability. The, the, the financial crisis is still in people's minds, and they, and they and they and they it's not far enough in the rearview mirror that they don't remember it. And so um, we sort of came out of that um, very well. We were not in the news for all the right reasons during that period of time, and so people view us rightly. I think people view us as a big, strong, stable, financially sound company that is a safe place to be, and so we we trade on that, we capitalize on that, and it's and it resonates uh, with people. So that's one. Um, the other one is um, is on people. I talked a little bit about our culture and the way we think about it. Our approach to the wealth management business is relationship oriented. We go into every new relationship, every new client engagement with the expect expectation that this is going to be years, if not decades and generations, as opposed to a transaction where they're sort of looking to do one thing and then do something else somewhere else. Um, and so we compete on, on, on sort of a business model. Um, and then it, it still is very much a people business. So we win the, the, our challenge, let me say it a different way. Our growth challenge on the distribution side is getting more meetings. It's not winning once we get to the meeting. Right? We're really good when we get our people in front of a prospect, just sold a business for $10 million, here's my situation, I got three kids, I got this, and whatever it is, I just sold it for $10 million. It's all the money I'm ever going to make, I don't want to have to make it again, I need your help. Right? I just sold an auto body shop. It's not a financially sophisticated person, they need help. We win a lot of those, we're really good at that. Um, we got to get in front of 50 more of those people instead of 20 more of those people. That's the growth challenge we have. Okay. Don, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's, uh, it's great to have uh, business leaders like yourself back here. It's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for our students to supplement what they're learning in the classroom by hearing uh, uh, from business leaders like yourself. It's, it's particularly uh, 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 a pleasure for us to have our, our own alumni back to talk about their careers and their uh, 
their journeys. So thank you for that. And we have a small little oh. token of appreciation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. This is our uh, W.L. Mellon Speaker Series. Fantastic. To put thank on, you. your, on your shelf. Thank, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.